sort of insight or an inkling into uh, uh, the, I guess, the mechanics, like the infrastructure, if you will, or the, the logistics of how we're transferring and looking up data. So uh, in your thesis, we cover hypertext and its usefulness in, in the sense of like linking separate files and separate elements and separate uh, documents and whatnot. So maybe you can go into a little bit of uh, how, <clears throat> how you chose hypertext as uh, a useful medium. Well, um, in the, the second half of the first chapter, I look at, well, I look at hypertext extensively. Um, I also look at technologies like web browsers, the mouse and why it was chosen and uh, graphical user interfaces. Um, those, the mouse and the graphical user interface, if I don't really need to get into them. If you are interested in them, go look up um, Stanford University's The Mother of All Demos uh, with Douglas Engelbart and his literal mother of all demos uh, that he did in uh, 69. Uh, and you'll see where those things come from and how they were developed. And you can, they tested a bunch of different devices. But one of the things that he inter in, introduced into that was um, a new idea at the time, uh, which is, which was kind of propounded by uh, a uh, eccentric figure, uh, Ted Nelson, who he noted that stories are generally told in a linear fashion. You go from the beginning, one, two, three, four, and things happen in a linear line. But when we think about stuff, you don't think about them in a linear fashion you think, um, I have to get dinner. And to get to dinner, I need to get all the recipes. And you know, you need to start thinking about farming. And all of a sudden, you bring back and you come around. And your work, mind works hypertextually more than it does linearly. So when you're reading a book, your mind doesn't actually really work with that. You're engaging with the associations of the words. And so we thought the best way to organize a computer, uh, an interface for a computer, would be hypertextually. So <clears throat> you think about this generally as something like uh, Wikipedia is a great example where you can, you know, play the game, uh, you know, um, get to the dictator uh, or uh, in the fastest or um, uh, you can link anything with anything else because everything in history is, well, we all exist in the same universe. So they're, inter they're, they're connected somehow. Um, so you're sort of saying the content itself uses its own keywords to relate itself to other other pieces, yeah. of right? That's yeah. the text part. But if you click on like if if you click on an image on your computer, so like uh, an icon, that's hypertextually linked to a another thing. Uh, so you have these all these um, different uh, actions that you can perform on your on your desktop that are linked with other actions and they're not linked in a linear fashion they're linked um conceptually thematically uh technically because in the way that allows you to organize them the best way and he took this to its extreme with the xanadu project uh which he worked on for you know decades and he made a prototype of it where you have a hypertextual graphical environment which is worth looking up uh he's got it's on his um YouTube program, just Ted Nelson on YouTube. Um, but one of the things that he did was, and you can, and this is this is cleverly dis, uh, displayed in the Mother of All Demos, is that you click on one thing, and then you it brings you to its associated elements. So you click on your inbox in your email, and then it brings you to your email, and then that email you click on that, and it opens the email but he wanted to take it further and you could see all the connections, but we weren't really ready for that and we never really did get to that. So instead of linking things, you know, you're just reading a paragraph on your page, he said, what if we had every, uh, what if we gave every, uh, everything a, well, he didn't say a lot of people working on this, you have each page linked to each other based on their, uh, based on their um, uh, their contextual relation with each other. And 
this ends up looking like a web more than a line. So when you have when you look at the structure of a program or a website or uh, anything like that, you have a kind of this connected web of um, uh, of uh, information uh, associations. So to put it in another way, it'd be like if you had that linear story, but like the beginning of the story would link directly to the end and the middle and the next sequence, right? It's yeah. Like just for pictorial illustrative reference, it would be like having the, the, the middle refer back to the beginning as well as the next chapter, but also everything in between. Right. Now imagine if you were on your Gmail account and you have, so you have the, your inbox here with a list of emails and you have your inbox starts, news set, and whatever. You have all these things on the side where you can go. Now imagine if that was all laid out, every email was laid out one after another and, and you couldn't organize them any other way. And if you wanted to look for, um, you wanted to look for, say, every email from, you know, your mother, you'd have to go to the index at the bottom and see, this is all the occurrence where um, your, your your mother sent you an email. You talk about your mother, and that doesn't work. So you type in, um, you you go through mother, and you go, okay, this is these are all the emails. So it links it this by the search to everything. So you can you're not moving around from beginning to the end, and then you go back. You're moving around from okay, I go from this page to the emails about mother to this email about my mother to I need to go to this. So you're jumping around from place to place in the in the in the diagram of the web page rather than going from one place to another and it didn't really show up like this at first you get a distributed diagram so you have more of a you know you have the the, the, the front screen and you have the subfolders and sub subfolders and you can create files that link to other ones and then you could say okay I want to create a thing here that links over to this folder here um, it more became more uh, important later on when you get uh, technologies like a browser, where the first browsers were all text-based and you're just reading a bunch of text. Here's my web page and it's just text, 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 text. But what you could do with the text, is you could take a word and say, uh, in Canada, you know, you say the word Canada and it links to, here's my page on Canada. And then the page on Canada and they, people started doing this more often. And then people started doing it with pictures and then people started doing it with everything and then everything became more and more hypertextual because it felt more natural uh, than uh, arranging a uh, digital object like a book uh, which we were used to now every medium references the mediums that come before so you opening a bunch of pages like a paper so i open notepad and i have a paper you open a website and it's kind of arranged in a bunch of different pages because we understood already that um, pages worked like that. Uh, and that's the that's one of the interactive elements of it. So, you, so what's the advantage of having this interactive element in as far as archiving and record keeping <clears throat> and history goes? Well, um, Wikipedia is an amazing thing. And imagine if you printed out every Wikipedia page and put it into an encyclopedia as if it was a book. Now, the book would be able to save better, but the thing about Wikipedia is that it has hypertextual elements, but it also has editing elements. So you can, it's fluid and it changes and it becomes more robust as time goes on. And you don't have that linking. So when you link from uh, someone like uh, John Snow to the uh, germ theory of disease, to the cholera epidemics, to something maybe you get interested in typhus, uh, and then you get interested in scientific method, and then you get interested in uh, uh, you know uh, pollution in London, and uh, yeah, and on and on and on and on and on, and all of a sudden you you know these things, and instead of reading the book on it, you you know what you're doing, and you see all the associations instead of. You know, you read one book on this, you read one book on this, you read one book on this, and you can see things in, hypertextually. You're seeing things in their context more effectively than you're not. And so when you have a contextually uh, specific um, uh, uh, object uh, record, then it's it's very necessary to see that 
that record in its context. So you have, which is why we place, uh, archivists place uh, analog objects in their context, because you need to see that context, but it's not hypertextual. It's, it's, it's just textual. It's just, you know, this box is related to this box because this box happened at this point in time, and the, all the stuff in this box happened at this point in time, and the ones in this box happened later. Whereas you can say, okay, I need everything in 1964, and then, you know, one of the things in the digital object uh, links to another object. You can just click on it and go, because your brain wants to go there. Um, you can easily get off track, but uh, for something like a um, text-based adventure game, uh, if you just print out all the, all, the, all the possible text answers and interactions, well, you're, you're reading a book out of order. Um, you're, uh, or you, <clears throat> um, something like, that's a very simplistic example, but something like a... Uh, like a choose uh, your own adventure book or something would be like the yeah. book but, trying to be hypertextual, but it's but then, still not because it's linear with the page numbers and references and you know, right. certain sections. Now, you get something more complicated, like a uh, like a, a more modern game, where they're still using hypertextual uh, elements to connect the things together. So you have a button on the page that you know does a fire spell or something, and that that button is connected hypertextually to the action in the code that does that, which is connected to the uh, the graphical signal that makes it do this, and it also connects to the you know number system, which uh, you know does the statistical hit, miss, and damage stuff. So you need to have those able, and to just take a screenshot of here's here's my character in World of Warcraft or whatever, and um, and uh, you're kind of missing all that technical stuff underneath uh, when you're looking at the uh, the code, which makes the game it's it, it's important to see the game which is you know the the fun part of it but when you look at the code and say how what were they doing here why were they why did they write it like this and why did they write it like that and to understand that this to understand the the origins of why they design programs uh like this now hypertextuality is a very umbrella term so there's a lot more technologies i didn't go really go past um 1980 in my thesis because I wanted to focus on the most fundamental uh, interactive elements of our digital files, which are, you know, the mouse. Uh, so it sounds like it's kind of like a rudimentary framework that you can use um, to more naturally, the way our brains more naturally think, where you can skip from subject to subject without having to, to, to sequentially go from start to finish, then right. move on, start to finish, move on. So like the benefits to that, I guess you could say would be as you get more data and as you um, do more pull requests on, on or searches or lookups, or, uh, that's where you see the biggest benefit, right? This, that sort of leads us towards the scalability. Yeah, um, that is, yeah, so you do need, yeah, so you mentioned scalability. It does lead us to that. So you need to understand why they like why something is interactive and uh, not just how but like uh why did why did the developer choose to use a mouse interface mouse keyboard interface rather than have a joystick or uh a uh something else or why did they why does this program have a draw pad or a touch screen because that works better that's why they didn't develop it because they thought it was cool they developed because this is the way it's going to work best in their mind um it may not actually be the best way but they skype being a good example of that but <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit meta but yes um uh the um we are recording right no <laughs> the uh the problem is that when you get something like this is that it's easy to save something uh from 1975 because it's a very small file and you can figure out how it works pretty simply compared to other things but as you get uh more and more complex digital objects you also get more digital objects because everyone starts using computers and everyone starts using uh these things and interacting with them and creating more and more digital objects you take a digital file uh, you take a digital picture with your phone you take a digital video you can set your camera to make 
need to take like a thousand vi- pictures in like half a second and that's a thousand digital files that you made in half a second so you need to somehow create a system that can do this at scale which means a certain amount of automation a certain amount of intuitive uh intuitiveness and a certain amount of uh adaptability um what types other, of in- intuition and adaptability are, are practical in, in this application? Well, um, like I said, the in the previous uh, part, we had that Selman Rushdie archive, which they did it in an ad hoc nature. So they built everything themselves. Um, and it was good, and it worked for that one thing. But it won't work for any other uh, object. So uh, what easy... Uh, seems to have been doing or is doing um, is they've been making a uh, a dictionary of or a repository of uh, hardware and software um, uh, environments so that it can it can read metadata and it can f- send it back and then render the necessary ones so it happens automatically so they have all these um instead of having to you know manually build one every time you get a new digital file which is it's not scalable you can do it for one and uh, you're probably only going to be able to do it for the most important digital file that you get in your entire archive and then you're going to be exhausted after and your budget's going to be exhausted after and you need to keep it up and this makes it so that it can do it at a larger scale and it does this by using it as a service so um it's a separate third party that you go to and you you know you pay the money so it's a business uh, but it's a business with that has a product that is geared towards making these things available to people and that and would be it, probably analogous with a, a game engine, right? Like the background engine that supports all the assets and textures and yeah, know. you could say it like that. It's um, it's kind of like you have a you have all those websites built on like the WordPress model, and so uh, or you know this or that model, and uh, it's kind of like the underlying thing that you can attach your files to. Um, there's still a lot of stuff that needs to be worked out, uh, like um, security, and is really important because security of the files, you don't want anyone coming and tampering with them because the integrity and authenticity of the files is very important because if you go in, well, you know what happens if you go in and edit uh, Wikipedia. Imagine what happens if you go in and edit um, something that's like an archive. That's just an encyclopedia. This is supposed to be the primary source that people go to to write history upon or uh right write that's what the encyclopedia is right about is from the archives usually right yeah and the encyclopedia interchanges because someone's misinterpreting or reading the wrong thing that someone made like oh windows was invented by you know uh joe small uh in 93 it's like mm, you know but then the record says that so is it right or is it wrong well you have to cross-reference it now so um, I get into a well, lot of... That brings of... us back to hypertext, I guess, too, because hypertext makes cross-referencing, like, mm-hmm. neat, basically. Right. So you have all this data that's connected to all the data, and then you can uh, travel through the data very quickly instead of, okay, now I need to go read this book, and now I need to go read that book, and now you have five books that you need to read. You need to scour them, whereas in hypertext, you can, well, with a digital book, you can just be like, search book for... Uh, appraisal and it brings up all the elements of appraisal and okay that's the paragraph i need to read and you don't waste your time reading like i'd like to thank you know this person and that person for you know this and that um and you can you know just hypertextually move yourself towards the part of the book that you need now scalability is is great because you need to be able to do this on a scale of millions and millions of times and this is made possible by you know um the uh, internet infrastructure that we have uh, which allows this kind of uh, multiple interaction so you can 
do this on a browser, and everyone has a browser, which means you don't have to go to the archive. Well, sometimes you might, if security is an issue, you can only access it in the browser. But all they have to do is set up a computer with internet access, and, or you could access it via, you type in like so-and-so archives, and then you say visit our you know, interactive archive, and you go click on that, and it opens up the thing, which file do you want to see? It op opens up the operating system, and then it opens up the program, and you're all of a sudden playing and interacting with these people's stuff. Uh, that they left for you to see. And that, if there's a hundred thousand or a million files, then that's kind of thing. So nothing's, it's, they're all not running at once. They're running as needed rather than as just having them always emulated. So you emulate them as needed, uh, which is the difference because you can't just, the Salman Rushdie computer at Emory is running all the time. It's a computer dedicated to emulating that one, those three computers that he had. And this one, you click on the link and it sends the request to emulate it to the program. So you're not, so you're storing it and it's only coming out as it's needed rather than having to figure it out for all your files at once. If it doesn't work well, then everyone's working on it. They're populating the uh, repositories uh, with more and more stuff every day. And the thing is that these 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 hardware and software environments are being populated by uh, by volunteers. So people who are uh, well, here's this environment. I'll, I'll I'll give you the definitions for this environment so that uh, you can emulate this type of file. And a lot of people are contributing uh, these software and hardware environments uh, to the dictionary so that um, more and more files can. Uh, become available. Now, the other thing that I said previously is that the, the silver lining in this is that most, there's an infinite variation of how you can build a computer, but most people, uh, they, um, they use generally the same 20 operating systems and the same 40 programs, and everyone uses very similar PC or Mac architecture with people who use Linux, uh, on the fringe, and people who make their own operating system being on the extreme fringe, uh, whereas uh, scientists uh, will generally, uh, if they need something, a computer to just do one thing, or computer technologists, they will, um, that is in the extreme minority. Um, and software engineers and uh, computer engineers will also be have different things that they need to try. So someone building computers will be using different environments because they will building, be building their own environment. Now, those are the most difficult cases. But generally, most files will, like most text files will be in Microsoft Word. Most spreadsheet files will be in Excel or VisiCalc if they're older or something like that. And you'll either be using a Mac OS or a Windows. Uh, so generally, we the, a lot of those are already populated. But then the conjunction, so the connect to the, um, the, but they're multiplying each other. So you're going to be using different programs on different hardware. So you have a ton of different uh, combinations, almost like an infinite amount of combinations that you have to try. So they're starting with the most popular and moving outwards. Uh, <clears throat> and it's a long time. This is the, vol the volunteer open source software that you're talking about? Yeah, that's the, um, that's the easy uh metadata uh, uh uh dictionaries so um a lot of these are online um you can actually go in and contribute uh, as well there's a lot of smaller programs that i don't really think it would be uh it, it would take a lot of our time away to get into um but the well, other to problem help, to help the viewers maybe you could uh um describe um uh... I guess the ad hoc na nature, maybe it's not evident to everybody who hasn't done networking or something like that, what an ad hoc oh, okay, uh, yeah. interconnectivity is. Maybe you could explain that a bit. Um, well, I could use um, a program that uh, that does, uh, that processes digital files for me, something like BitCurator or Archivematica. Um, that processes the files for me, or I could use an ad hoc system, meaning like uh, I would get 
the I would put together the proprietary like so I'd get I process videos I get my I find the program that I want to use and then I process them on my own I would uh, process all my own stuff using um, various uh, various programs that I would choose uh, along the workflow whereas these other programs uh, Preservica, Archimedica, BitCurator, they they perform their own workflow and they do it well uh, for the most part, but um, you're kind of letting them do the whole thing yourself. Whereas an ad hoc one would be like, okay, I'm gonna use this program to process video files and it's gonna take forever. I'm gonna use this program, uh, maybe like Audacity or something to process um, uh, uh, audio. Audio files, thank you. And I'm gonna use this program to process uh, like text files. And what this does is it um, it puts them into formats that you want. So you're migrating them, and then you're putting them into the original. So you have, uh, and it also makes copies of them. And so it's kind of like you're finding a common denominator or a centralized place with with yeah. A standard like an ISO standard where everyone that accesses it can know what right to, so we what have um, what protocols to run and what software and all that yeah so one of the things you do is you um, you want to make a access versions often and you want to make a uh, preservation version and these are often standardized because um, you want a loss like a like an access version a good uh, like a lossy version uh, is good for a, a lossy format is good for access because there's a lot less data that you're accessing. But for preservation, you want to keep all the ones and zeros the way that you got them as much as possible. So you want a lossless version of a picture or a video, which means so you're talking about basically the difference between a bitmap image and a JPEG, where a JPEG yeah. is compressed and has lost some detail, but it's most like you get the you get you the get, picture. Like, yeah, and this is where we get con well, this is where you get the idea of content versus form. So a lossless video would take so much space, but you get all the information, you see all the stuff. Same with a picture or like a PNG versus a JPEG or something like that. And this is kind of where we get into interactivity, where <clears throat> uh, well, you have McLuhan's ideas of uh, hot and cold media, where um, essentially, and uh, people are going to disagree with me with this, is that the uh, something is cold, so you have to put more effort into it uh, in order to um, in order to get what you need out of it. Uh, whereas something is hot, it you you are interacting with it, but so the difference. So it's a relative distinction. So something is hot that you just kind of passively take in, or something is cold, you need to add heat in it. So you the amount of in uh, participation you need to put into a uh, digital object in order to uh, get what you need out of it. So uh, absorb the content. Is As a practical what, matter, what you mean by get what you need, that's like the thing you're looking up, right? That's yeah, the information. So if you open trying. up a video, yeah. what you need is to be able to just view the video and see what's going on. But for a video game, you need to be able to, um, you need to be able to interact with it. Like if you're going into a web page and you have a web page saved, and you want to be able to like click around, the internet's a very cold place. You need to interact with it. There's warmer areas to it, but the um, so which is why I I say in my thesis, uh, archivists need to be able to need to carry thermostats to determine how hot and cold a, a digital file is in order for saving because they don't need to save because for certain files the content isn't as important as um, as the interaction and vice versa. Uh, so uh, we get back to what we talked about before. Uh, I do want to get into the other thing, the other problem with emulation uh, of these fi files is reproducibility. So um, while well, we've all played, uh, uh, we've all played well, not all of us, but some of us have played uh, old video games. Like, we want to go and play. Uh, can't get a hold of. Uh, I don't have a PlayStation, but I want to play Chrono Trigger. And so I want to play it on my PC. So I get a, a PS1 emulator or, a, or something like that, or a SNES emulator. 
and I put it on and the textures are all garbage. It renders the speech and it's moving at a different speed and you're like, I can't play this, but I will. Uh, <laughs> and, or you play and it doesn't always work properly. And that's the, one of the biggest problems with emulation is um, in the, in, in the translation from the, uh, the file to the rendered, to the, um, to the rendered uh, hardware and software uh, environment, you get a lot of, it needs to work exact, it needs, the game needs to get the same outputs that it would have had if uh, it would have been on a PS1, uh, which is very difficult because um they you're, you're, it's like having two people talking in two different languages while you're trying to ex you know uh, hear both of them at the same time uh, and understand every nuance of it uh, and that's very difficult and you want it to and happen streaming the interpretation you mean too right right and you want it to happen every time you open it up and anyone who's done any coding will know that if you get a different error every single time you try something um and sometimes it'll be a completely different error uh i mean you so try functionally the same thing. speaking then hot systems would be more prone to that type of error right um yeah uh well it depends it really depends on what you're what you're working with um some it's so that refers more to the medium uh and the appraisal of the medium so um how much interaction is needed for this digital object but sometimes a you shoot a 3d movie and the interactive element is going to be a lot more complex than a very complicated 2d movie uh so there are it's it's, it's different for everything and sometimes you get uh, a poorly made uh video game and it just it didn't work on its first system and now you have to make it work on a new system so have fun with that um so you get well, these allow me to bring this back out into context then um, using your your reference from a from a video game um the screen is 2d the picture it shows you is 2d but the layer through time the series and sequence of pictures that show you the environment as you move around and as things are distorted and parallaxed and whatever from angles and depth and distance yeah you're saying the environment itself is sort of like um what did you call that the uh you said you store you store the raw version for the archive for the archivist right the, the um access the access and storage version. that's yeah. right so the access version would be akin to a screenshot and the storage version would be akin to like all of the environment possibilities that you could possibly run at any given point going in through this through this game engine is that right yeah um on a preservation side if someone's access you need it you need the original uh the bit accurate original uh to be the same because that's the way that the creator organized the bits to as best as your ability. But at the same time you need, um, for the access version, if someone just, okay, why do you need this? Oh, I just need to experience it. Uh, so you don't need that. Um, you don't need the original. You don't need to give them the original. Cause like, it's like, oh, you need to uh, give someone, I, I need to look at the Gutenberg Bible. It's like, okay, cool. Well, I know I need to look at the original. It's like, why? Because I want to read the original. It's like, no, it's not good enough. Well, I want to do a, um, a chemical analysis of this part of the page just to see. And here's my, uh, here's my research uh, that I want to do to see, you know, why or maybe see exactly when it was actually printed down to the thing with our new uh, chemical analysis thing. So they would need the original for that. But generally, um, you don't need the original if you just want to play the game. Uh, you, you copy, a, you pirate a game, and you're copying a new copy, and you're making a new digital, digital object on your computer with new metadata and all that stuff because you don't care about having an original. And there's a lot of romanticism around the original. Uh, people are like, oh, I love books because they're books. And it, there's the, the, that transcendental uh, nature the transcendence of the object doesn't really take much into account for this because, well, why do you want to look at the original? Because it's more beautiful. It's more accurate. It's like all the same words are there. 
we took the highest resolution pictures of this book. Like, if you want to smell the leather or the vellum, then I'm sorry, no, you can't have access. But and it's the same with digital objects. You want to interact with all the ones and zeros? No. No, I, this is something different. Like it's backed up and we have redundancies and it's being checked every 30 minutes, but uh, here's a lossy copy of it, or here's a this and that. Now, the thing that is interesting about digital objects is that they can be copied without very much damage. So you copy a book and you have to sit there and turn the page. Every time you touch it, you're where you're uh, weathering that object. Every time you move it, you're weathering it. Every time it gets some light, you're weathering it. Now with a digital object, control C, control V, boom. It's, 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 it's got new metadata, but do you really need that original metadata? Depends. Yeah, and if you need it, you can always query it later. So Exactly. <laughs> so there are advantages to digital objects that uh, you don't have with uh, physical ones. Um, the problem happens when you know, you run out of storage space and when uh, the bit level data degrades. So that's why you have like lock boxes, which check that. Uh, lots of copies keep stuff safe, locks. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, also worth looking into. Those are really interesting. Um, and so the point is how do the, 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 the problem becomes how do you get across these historical records? these digitally historical records, because we've been making them for 50, 60 years now, um, and they are historical. Just because they're computers doesn't mean they're not part of the past. How do you convey the most nuance in the record to the researcher and to the just the curious public as effectively and as often as possible? So and without imposing a bias or any, without adding information to it, right? Because that's right. Yeah, exactly. So you, well, you can do that. There's a lot of people that argue that if you, uh, if you describe the record, so you have to often say, here's what it is. So like, you have to give it a title. So people are like, I'm looking for that. And you have to give it a title, and everyone say, well, if you give it a title, you're reproducing, and that's a very um, linguistically relative argument, which I'm not going to get into. And so. I'm going to impose a title on it so you can find it, period. I'm not arguing that point. Um, and, but I'm not going to be like, this was the greatest game that humanity has ever made. And then, you know, just because I liked it during that week or something, or I spent way too much time with it. Um, I'm going to tell you what it is so you can get to it. I'm going to tell you the metadata as much as I can, according to, you know, the rules of archival description or whatever set of archival description standards there are. But, the rest is up to you and the whole thing is that i should be able to give that to you with as much nuance as possible if it's necessary uh and so it is a balancing act what can are i there's, do are there standards for archival descriptions or anything like that like or is that there's something a, that has to be developed no there's a number of those and they've been around for a while the uh, canada and a number of other like a lot of this canadian associated places use the rules for archival description um, which do have their problems. Uh, there's an international ISAT G. There was a really interesting one, um, uh, I believe it's called Rickham, that I really thought was interesting because it uses an XML based description standard that links stuff together using XML. Uh, I'd have to get into it, but I thought it was just, I thought it was amazing when I came across it and everyone's kind of like, oh, that's neat. And I was like, this is. This is wonderful. Love it. And it, you, well, you know how XML works. It's like this. Oh, yeah. It's like almost like a sentence. So you can write out things, and then the context becomes evident based on what it is. Maybe describe it in detail, just for the viewers who might not be familiar, though. Um, like, not not like dive into it, but just superficially explain what an XML sheet would look like and why it's useful. Well. I think it's best to explain that it's you're describing stuff within the context of its hypertextual associations. Thank you for all those $30 words. Um, <laughs> but uh, so essentially, well paid for. Yeah. So um, you're describing something like this is this written by this at this time. And so all the things that have the, co the, the label like 1962 will be linked with all the other things linked with 1962 will link linked with all the other things. So you, if you lay it out, it looks like a hypertextual web. 
and then you can interact with the records through an inter uh, hypertextual uh, 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 sort of in a hypertextual sort of way. And you can render this because it's all just written in XML. Uh, all you have to do is define the values, you know, make the software to view it. So, so it's sort of like parsing the content into a bunch of keywords that are searchable, right? Yes. You're, you're, you're parsing a text into something else that's indexable or searchable or fileable. Right. But those keywords also make up the description of the object and also link to all the other objects. So right, they're derivatives of its content, kind of thing. Right. So I've yeah, there's a there's Just a lot to help of... other people who aren't like familiar with coding XML by hand like we are. <laughs> yeah, I learned about that a couple of years ago, so I'm sure it is. Um, uh, I'm sure it is uh, progressed and changed into something else, and someone's came up with a new one. But archivists are always trying to figure out better ways to describe a record. So title date does date mean and they're trying to make it so that it's the same every time so that you don't look at a description and go okay what am i looking at here which did which 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 archival like standard is this so that i can because we want to make as many records as easily available to the to the um to the researcher or the curious or anybody as as quickly as possible so that we can you can tell us what you want so we can go and help you get more stuff and bring and so you're not spending time looking for stuff. You're you're spending time doing the research or so It sounds like it's sorry. It sounds like you're saying the consistency of the formatting is really important to um, the storage and curation of of what you're, you're indexing, right? Yeah, that's 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 a good way of putting it. Yeah. Just gonna cool. I guess that <laughs> that sort of brings us back to what you were saying. I I, I cut you off tangent here just to, to help everybody follow but we were on uh, reproducibility and the copying of of files and, uh, right. and how, that, how that relates to its scalability which is the co the quantity and volume if i'm not mistaken of our record keeping right so the reproducibility uh deals with the quality of the uh emulation so you you um uh you get the, oh, sorry, I'm gonna just close my door here. <laughs> just. <sighs> sorry, Megan kind of yells when she's on her thing because she has headphones no, on. Good. She can't hear herself, so she goes, yeah, pharmacy. I covered it already, you're good. Okay. <laughs> It's just right. a market, so when you're skipping through, you can see a big palm and you know where to start looking. All right. So one of the things that we want to, that is, that we're interested in as archivists is providing the uh, a glitch free, um, unless like the glitches are inherent, like you can't really play a uh, Bethesda game without dealing with the glitches. And if you take all the glitches out, it's not a Bethesda game. But right. um, it's not original <laughs> anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Todd Howard. But um, he's part of the interactive process. But the thing is that if we make the glitches, then we're imposing, uh, we're making it harder for the researcher to do their exploration. So if, I, if, if we give them a book, uh, and like here's the here's the record book go nuts they can just flip through it and they have to read it uh, or we could give them pictures of it an online thing which actually makes it easier because they don't have to go to the archive and get a pass and say hi to security and be like hey Jim how's it going third day here because I have to come all the way here um, and you go in which is helpful because you can interact with the archivists and be like hey here's what I'm working do you guys know of anything related which is why archivists are very helpful because they work with every day and they can, you know, give you more stuff. But if you just take a picture, like high quality pictures and put them online for you to search, then it's accessible to more people. And if you can read every word, then it's glitch free and you're not trying to decipher is that an and or an it's. Um, uh, and thinking about the uh, New York Sun from uh, the 1860s, where they uh, they had a digitized version of that, and I just I couldn't read any of the columns. You could see the paper, but you couldn't read it. So 
the problem with emulation is it's always glitchy. Your the translation issue, like I mentioned before, makes it so that you are interacting with it as like a Frankenstein version of it when you want to be interacting with it as much as possible. You don't want to be focused on you, you we want to be part of if when I'm saying <clears throat> sorry. When I'm trying to say that the interactivity is important to the record, then I'm I want to be able to again put them in the seat of the creator or the you know player uh, or the user um, in such a way that they're trying they're seeing what they can do. Now, there are, I, in my introduction I mentioned that like there are some extinct um, instruments that people are trying to reproduce. Uh, there's like a Norwegian bow lyre and the giga, where we don't have examples of these instruments. And so we're losing the interactive nature of that. So if you're researching musical history, you kind of want to get your hands on it and at least try and play it once. Now, if you try and play it and it glit in your, your, your violin that you're trying to be, okay, I'm uh, doing violin history and I'm trying to just get my hands on one, so I'm trying to play it, but then all of a sudden it just, the, the bow breaks and it just kind of falls apart because you know it's a glitchy violin for example then you're not really going to get the you're not really figuring out what it's like to play one you need and if you don't have one in existence you kind of have to imagine it so it's like you start up the, the spreadsheet program you're doing it it's like hey this is VisiCalc. the green spreadsheet comes up and all of a sudden it just boom, shuts down you're like neat you set it up again, and then it glitches into, you know, pixels everywhere all over the screen. You know, like, okay, this is, I'm not learning anything. So you want that, when that experience of the interaction becomes necessary to the understanding of the record, and you can't provide that in a reproducible time, because you're not going to want to go on there once, you're going to want to go on there um more than once because if you're researching you're going to kind of come back if you get an idea you're like okay i want to test this thing so i need to go back and check it again why would why would why would they go and put that column there when this column's here why would they do this and you interact with it and go oh because it's just easier because the mouse moves like this so it's just that makes sense for them to put it there based on the architecture when we're used to a new architecture so you need to actually understand that. Um, and that's a great example, too, because that's not something you'd normally log. Like, if you had a spreadsheet and you were keeping a record of, say, somebody's ledger of expenses or something, you right. wouldn't necessarily make a margin note as an archivist and say, this was outlaid this way for ease of hand motion. That's yeah. something that you would preserve by way of interactivity, right? Is yeah, that sort no. of what you're getting at? Yeah, so there's different things. Like, why would they put that column there? Well, because they thought it was, it worked with that particular system because they were actually using a draw pad or a touch pad. Now, the original mouse um, uh, tests where they were just trying to figure out which uh, interactive devices worked best, and they came out with the mouse when Engelbart and English and his team and all of them at Stanford figured out how to make a user interface that we use today. Um, they tested like a knee clicker thing. They had like a like a select knob. They had a joystick. They had a, a light pen, and they found that the mouse was the most ac. It was the most accurate and the quickest to learn and the easiest to manipulate. Uh, and so they came up with a mouse thing, and they actually had another set of dials over here, uh, and then. Because that became the default very quickly, um, computers were designed around that uh, interactive system. Now, I use this so things aren't designed arbitrarily. They're designed based on the human, the things that humans have to deal with. They're designed based on how we interact with information and how we think and how we actually move physically. So we have an infinite variation of things we can do. Sorry, uh, let me go back. We have a finite amount of things that we can accomplish with our physical and mental capabilities. But within those finite things, like I can 
lift this up, I can click, I can move around. Within that, there's infinite variation. So um, a hand can only do a certain amount of things. So if I had another hand, we'd probably have another control interface. Uh, and this changes for the task as well. The medium is the message. If I'm drawing something, I'm on the computer, I want to be drawing something. But a mouse is going to do it because my hand works better with a, you know, a draw pad. Whereas if I was um, handicapped in a way that I didn't have a hand, I might invent something else uh, or I might interact with it in a different way. But the way we interact with something and the beauty of what we can create happens in that infinite variety. So we have a, we have a pen or a pencil I have here and they all work pretty much the same way in to uh, describe to make marks on a sheet of paper. And there's an infinite way we can make a pen. They all look kind of different. You, like, it's rare when you see a pen drawer that there's two that are the same, but they all have the same basic ways of doing things, and they all perform them slightly differently. And they perform them slightly differently because someone had a thought that this one way will look better or act better or be better or be different. Maybe they just wanted to try it. But those thoughts of difference and variety are what's important. What thoughts did people have to bring them to make this decision? And the interactive elements of a digital object definitely allow you to understand why that variety happened within the constraints of what we can do. And without having to say so explicitly, without having to sit people down like daycare and say, this is why we did it. It's because yes. they experience it and they can gain additional information that's not written or picture or whatever you're looking at. Yeah. They gain, glean additional information from that through the experience as opposed to being taught it or received. Well, another example I can think of is you remember in learning about uh, early modern warfare and, you know, they'd all stand in a line and like stand at each other 100 meters apart and, you know, they shoot into each other and we don't understand that so like why would they do that like why would they possibly do that and then they're like you know what well, let's all go stand in a line and shoot some muskets and then we will understand that <laughs> and who's and, standing in the front row like really <laughs> yeah well uh criminals usually prisoners maybe uh, yeah it, it's hmm. depends on the army but yes 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 also volunteers sometimes but the but why they did that when so it also the other thing is that we place a lot of I, a lot of people say the the phrase uh present centric where we understand things the way we understand them now and to interact things the way we interact with them we put our well this why did they do this why did they do that and by tinkering we understand better now the problem with that is that you play a video game now or you use um, a spreadsheet now and you go back and you, you play a, one of the, that new Doom game and you're like, wow, this is awesome. Just, it's heavy metal going and there's all these explosions and you're killing demons. And then you go back and you play like the first Doom game and you're like, wow, this is... I actually prefer the first one, to be honest. <laughs> it might be nostalgia, but it was just easier. But there's interactive elements that are completely different and to say that this one is better because it's newer well it, it is a more interactive game but that was back then it would have had the same emotional thing so you're still missing that you still have that present disconnect but we have the ability to try and put ourselves in someone else's shoes and so the interaction helps with that too like I said, so it can't put you downsides in... to it. Like it's not impervious to fault, but it's just it's it's a, another layer of abstract knowledge right. to gain from it, the record. Right? It brings more nuance. So, like I said, uh, this is probably uh, well, I think I said this in the last thing is that it doesn't put you in the head. It puts you in the seat of the person who is interacting, and that's that's still pretty good. And with all implied biases and like environmental factors of the current time influencing that experience, right? Right. It's but you can try. And that would well, sort of be implicit. Like, I don't think you'd be able to get away from the like if they if 100 years from now, they never use a computer mouse and they have to look up what a mouse is and say, oh, my God, people actually move things around on their table 
to yeah. select. Don't they, like just their, obvious, don't they just use their? they just use their implant so... to upload themselves into the ether verse, yeah. and they interact. And we just assume it's natural to look at a screen and move our arm around and push a finger down. <laughs> right, like who knows what we could be like? We could we could get like, we could be going about our day and like as we normally do, and then we could have an implant in our head that allows us to do work while we're going around in this ethereal. Uh, you know, internet where we can actually walk around and this is second world kind of like Ready Player One or something like that. And we don't have to sit there with like goggles or you know, we can think and stuff will happen on our screen. Yeah. Like these interfaces will happen. Well, they, okay, I don't know what will happen, but the thing is, is that archivists, and this is probably one of the things that I'm getting at mostly is that archivists need to be ready to adapt to new things because we've already we're I'm talking about mice and graphical user interfaces but since those have come around they're almost obsolete now because so many people are using cell phones where you have a touch screen and now we have VR and there's tons of other stuff that people use every day that I didn't even get into I could write a book about the history of interactive technologies uh, if I get bored I might but, we'll have another episode on it later. Maybe I would like to get into other topics, but I think I've I think we've covered most of it. Um, yeah, I think so too. If you had something to throw in for conclusion, maybe to to summarize and wrap up. Um, I think I did a lot, a lot of what I said in the last ten minutes was a good summarization. I think one of the last things I want to say is that what I've seen in the last couple of years has. Uh, there were archivists before that said this is what needs to happen, but they're pessimistic. And now I, uh, what I'm seeing is I'm willing to be tentatively optimistic. Uh, and we have people and the archival world needs to work towards it. And what we need to do is, as archivists, we need to become more computer savvy. But as citizens uh, all over the world, we need to understand that our history is right there for us to interact with. And yes, it's hard to go in and you know sit there and interact with it, but when the archivist brings you a box and you open it up, there's always a story in that box uh, somewhere. And that's one of the joys of being an archivist is that there's always something there. And we want to share that with the public and all you have to do is come in and ask. Um, and forever when somebody looks it up, it'll be something that you did productively in your life that contributed to society's greater understanding and awareness right. of the world we live in, which I think is a beautiful thing. If, yeah. Uh, any science can do that. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think that's so I should shout out to the uh, Software Preservation Network. Uh, again, we've been talking with Jordan Roy, master, yes. blah, blah, blah. You yeah, should, should plug your name and your thesis. <laughs> yeah, so the thesis, the, name of your thesis, the title. Oh, uh, yeah, our XML metadata for the video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, the thesis is preserving interactivity towards next generation digital digital preservation philosophy and systems. Um, faculty, faculty. Uh, it's a arts faculty history. Your school. U of M, the University of Manitoba. There you go. Uh, should be able to find it. Also, uh, go look up Douglas Engelbart's work uh, and look. Um, that's just uh, uh, Ted Nelson's always fun. Nelson, yeah. And um, also, uh, archive.org. Go check out your local archives if you're interested in something. One of them probably has cool stuff for you. And uh, look up the Software Preservation Network. They are the people working on all the stuff I'm talking about. And so check them out. They have a bunch of stuff just like this online where they talk about their work progress. Uh, they are on YouTube under the Software Preservation Network. And you can look up all the technologies that I've discussed. Uh, in my thesis, most of my footnotes have the um, uh, URLs to all the stuff I talk about. So it is a very interactive Shout thesis. All open source, too. Yes, open source all is amazing. <laughs> um, cool, yes. Up. All right. Thank you very much. Ciao.